Thank you, Dr. Joe. You set a very nice tone for the beginning of our service. Will you join me now in the call to worship, which we'll read responsibly. Throughout all our lives, God is with us. Praise be to God. Even when we are faced with difficult situations, God's presence is near. Which way? Let us open our hearts today to God's gentle leading. Join me now in praying the prayer of invocation. Eternal God, you are the beginning and ending of all things. You promise to wipe away every tear that death and mourning will be no more. You make your home among us and abide with us as our God. Help us to live as the saints you call us to be, that we may truly be your people, living and doing your will. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are supposed to do our presentation of Bibles to our third graders, but several of them are unable to be here because of circumstances beyond their control. But is Olivia here this morning? Yeah, that was our one holdout, no? So maybe we will, we will present our Bibles another day.
Let us pray. Eternal God, as we gather on this day of remembrance, we are so grateful for your steadfast love through the ages. In the words of the psalmist, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We are grateful, we are filled with awe that we can come into your presence and have a sense of the eternal, have a feeling of the eternal essence of our loved ones and those who have gone before in history and know that somehow they are safe in your hands and that we too are safe in the continuum of your love. Our faith is sometimes so weak. We try to be confident that you continue to walk with us, but help us in our unbelief. We ask that you comfort those in pain, sickness, or sorrow, protect the weak and the discouraged, defend from danger the first responders, the medics, the fireplace, firefighters and police, those who are service for our country. Help us to appreciate the moments of our lives from the simple pleasures of hearing the laughter of children, of colorful leaves, tasty food, to the more profound joys of friends and family, the privilege of making choices in our lives, living in the warmth of your grace. We join now in praying the words Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> we are so grateful for all of the ways our church is supported to do its mission in the world. There are a variety of ways you can continue to support us in person by giving offerings into the plates at the front or rear of the church, online through Venmo or PayPal or even through the mail or by EFT withdrawals. Whatever way we contribute, we are helping to make our community and our world a better place. Let us pray. God, thank you for the privilege of being able to pitch in and to help out in very real ways through the church. Amen.
Lovely, Dr. Joe. You can't help singing along without opening your mouth with that one. Will you join me now, standing and with your masks on? Let's do the doxology. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 9, 6 through 9. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you'll find it on page 639. This passage is an encouraging one. If you'd read the prior passage, you would have been a little discouraged, but here we hear encouragement. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a fish, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It, is, it will be said on that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. May this mean something to you. Back in 2007, I had the opportunity to attend the General Synod of the United Church of Christ, which was taking place in Hartford, Connecticut, which made it very convenient to go. Well, after a very inspiring meeting, I got out and was walking uh, just along one of the hallways, and this woman uh, approached me and uh, greeted herself, uh, a young pastor um, from the Missouri Conference. And I um, looked at her and I had no idea at the moment who she was. Well, as she then looked at me and she said with a, that nice Southern accent, she said, Reverend Rawls, don't you know who I am? I'm B. Allred's daughter. And at that moment, I just broke down and cried. I just lost it. I mean, not boohooing, but I just was crying. Um, and the reason, I want to say this, I'm not a crier. Even times when I wish I could cry, I, I, I can't. But I couldn't stop myself at that moment. And the reason was that B was the last funeral that I did and of five that I did in about, I, I think it was like eight or nine days at Beck's United Church of Christ in Lexington. Um, all people that I knew um, 
except one very well, uh, friends who had all died um, prematurely, some tragically, all suddenly. Uh, and uh, after this had happened, I had gone to a conference to um, kind of get myself together. And the uh, morning of that conference was to start. 9-11 happened. And I remembered coming back from that conference feeling like just numb, like I had nothing left, nothing but misery. I didn't feel God at all. And I, I, just, uh, I just wondered what I could give. Well, the reason I bring all that up is I felt a lot like that this week. Often when I preach on All Saints Day, I speak fondly of those we have lost, but I'm not able to fondly remember right now. Uh, you know, for fear that I'll break down. I mean, if I were to look at, when I look at the list this year, uh, my heart breaks, but if I were to add to that the list from the year before as well, those that we lost, that we were not able to mourn, those that we were not able to celebrate, it's almost too much. Because these are people we have known and loved for me 17 years. People who sang in the choir, uh, people we saw every Sunday, some who drove us crazy, Others we admired, others had a big, big impact on our lives, and some who left us all too soon. You see, when you lose someone, you not only lose that person, but it's as if you lose the world as it was before when they were there with you. How can we do anything but more? And that's okay, because Jesus said, blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. I was reading, we, my wife and I read together um, through the scriptures each morning, and we were reading Psalm 14, and I was struck by how much one verse resonated with that feeling where the writer writes, how long must I bear this pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? You see, grief is like that. Sometimes the pain is too much to bear. We, we wonder how we'll get through the day. And even after years of, of years later, after there's been a loss, a song can come on the air, uh, uh, a memory can come to mind, or the, even the smell of something, or running into a minister at a conference meeting, and all the pain explodes once again without warning. And yet we are called today to confess our faith. And I feel like the Israelites, when they cried out in captivity, when they were in Babylon, how can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Well, how can we confess a faith when we're not feeling it? If we're not sure we even have it. You see, I, I, I've come to believe that faith is something rather messy. And it involves struggling with doubt. And uh, it's about struggling to trust. And sometimes it's wrestling with, and sometimes it's wrestling with someone. That someone being God. As Jacob wrestled with God. Uh, and uh, in the wilderness, 
and uh, with what they said was an angel. But afterwards, the angel said, as a blessing, I'm going to give you a new name. And that new name is Israel. And the word Israel, which is a name we all claim, means one who strives with God. You see, it's faith is when we try to hold on to God when there's nothing but darkness ahead and darkness behind and we feel nothing below, no ground below. And I wish there were three steps I could give you today that would say, this is how you have faith. This is how you come to believe. But there's no such thing as that. What comes to mind was the story we've been talking about throughout the day when uh, a man came to Jesus whose son was an epileptic and was having seizures all of the time. And, uh, and he brings him before Jesus. And Jesus looks at this man and says to him, if you're able, all things can be done for those who believe. Now, I've got to tell you, if I were that father, I would have looked at Jesus and said, are you kidding me? Every day, this my son has had seizure after seizure, sometimes falling into the fire we, we built for our meals. I've prayed and I've prayed to save him from this. And then finally, the man says the most honest thing I've ever heard as a response to Jesus. He says, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. At least I'm trying. I'm holding on the best that I know how. That's what real faith is. I'm holding on for dear life, hanging by my fingernails. I don't know if you know the history of the song that we just sang today that's called Credo. But the words to this song were found in a, in a cave in Cologne where Jews were hid during World War II, somebody dared to say, I believe in God, you know, even when he's silent. Help me to trust when I see no reason. These times are not tests from God, friends, because God never tests us, and God never leaves us. Even if we feel that we're like an orphan, rather God is feeling the pain that we are feeling. It is Christ who wept at the grave of Lazarus. It is, it is Isaiah who said of Jesus, surely he bore our pain and carried our griefs. A Christ who's with us through it all, just pleading with us to somehow hold on, even when we can't. And even when we let go, it's he who holds on to us. And even when we walk away, he is the one who comes searching for us as the good shepherd for the lost sheep. That's God. That's Christ. That's the heart of the message of the cross. As Richard Rohr wrote, I believe, if I am to believe Jesus, that God is suffering love. Some wounds will never heal completely, friends. And we wouldn't want them to. But faith is not simply holding on to Christ to get through the day. But believing that death is not the last chapter. Paul tells the church in Thessalonica, we would not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death 
so that you will not grieve like the rest of the world, like those who have no hope. Rather, our last breath is not the last word. There is a future, and our scripture this morning speaks about it. The prophet Isaiah speaks of God throwing us a giant feast, I see it as a beautiful day on this mountain and green grass and, and clear skies. And, and God sets this table with white linen and, and, and wonderful china and, and the choicest of foods and the best wines ever, the good stuff. But that's not what's most important. There's something far more important than the food and the wine, and that's the people who celebrate it with us. Our parents, grandparents, our brothers and sisters, our children. Gene Tucker, when commenting on this scripture in Isaiah, says, well, readers may see the end of death as the focal point of this. He says, this text emphasizes the end of mourning, the end of grief. But I also think the emphasis is on death, which is God's last enemy to be defeated. I think something that God hates. And Isaiah writes here in the scripture, and he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. You see, often in the Psalms, the psalmist will write, Lord, deliver me, because I'm about to be swallowed up by Sheol or by death. But here, God swallows up death. And God will then wipe the tears from our faces and hold us like a mother would hold her crying child and comfort us. As Jesus said, which I take literally, blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. There will be peace. There will be joy. And we will be thankful that we held on to our faith, held on to God for dear life, for in the end, God delivers. God, not death, has the last word. And as Isaiah concludes this, he says, we all begin to testify, saying, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Friends, every time we come around that table, it's a reminder of that feast to come and of the people who will share it with us. Amen. Friends, we will not be uninformed about those who have died. We grieve so much, so many. We feel such loss, even as we cling to hope. We encourage each other and all they brought to us and the gifts they shared with us as we say out loud their names. Lenore Sterrett. Muriel Garlic. Donald Robbins. Lillian Weymouth. James Neese.
Stanley cost. Donald Butterworth. Joan Linden. Judy O'Leary Meacham. James Reesey. Rose Matoshin. Douglas Fleisch. Ruth Williams. Jeanette Vale. Ryan Mora. Rose Marie Grosso. Shirley Porter. Ronald Corallian. Margaret Carlton. Let us pray. O light of Christ, we have witnessed lives well lived and lives cut too short. We are left below this great cloud of witnesses to continue the struggle for justice and love in this world. And yet we lament that we have lost these dear ones. May their memories be a blessing and a light to our labor. Amen. Today, when we name so many who are dear to us, we feel the waves of grief rise as we gather around this table to do what we always have done, to remember, to share, and to bless. We remember those who were once here with us. We feel their absence. We share in the mystery of sacred story that reaches across lifetimes and generations the story that breaks us and is poured out with new meaning once again. Let us pray. God of all the ages, be with us now so that we can find your presence again in these ordinary elements of grain and grape. Even when we are not in our place, may we find in this bread your wholeness. May we find in this cup your joy. Fill these elements and to us with your spirit, that we might see your presence in your whole creation. Amen. We imagine, friends, how the disciples must have grieved remembering that night Jesus was betrayed how we broke the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. Ministering to you in Christ's name, we give you this bread. And we also remember how he gave to them from the cup and said, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Ministering to you in Christ's name, we take and drink of the cup.
Let us pray together. Holy One, thank you for this feast. We have remembered whose we are and who we love. We have blessed our grief and tasted goodness. So let us go now to be light and salt for this world. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen. I invite you all to join in singing the hymn 637 for all the saints. Please rise in body or spirit and mask up to sing. standing, join me in the song of Simeon. Holy One, now let your servant depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared for all people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Would you bow your heads for the benediction? And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you. Amen.
Yes. I thought that was very.